Hey there YouTube, welcome to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob and I am a solo RPG and solo board gamer. <laughs> All right, so I figured I'd just do something a little different this time for this video. So, um, this video, what I'm going to talk about in this one and do is to show you guys how I do my wilderness adventures and terrains and encounters, all of that. And this is a follow-up from a comment um, from Jason Kemp. And he says, to clarify, I'm interested in your wilderness tables, particularly those involved in detailing hex contents. I'd like to see what kind of tables you build to support your wilderness games and how you design them. Please let me know if you need more details for my request. Well, Jason, I think uh, you clarified that pretty well, and I'm going to get into that. I'm going to do a little bit more. So, the first thing you have, I'm, you're going to want to do. You don't have to do this. You know, one thing that I do and you may want to do for yourself is, first of all, decide what kind of paper you want to use for your map. Me, I prefer blank. I like blank paper, particularly drawing paper. But there's a lot of options out there to choose from, and I'll leave it up to you. And I'll show you some of the things I've used in the past, and we'll move on from there. Well, obviously, there's always the good old standby graph paper, which I'm sure probably most of you out there have. Now, you can also go with this actual hex. <coughs> Um, and what I had done with this is, this is actually out of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, Dungeon Master's Guide, and it had a section in the back, you could photocopy this, I mean you can right there see where the pages of the book were, and of course it scaled it up a little bit more for you, and then it went to, oh my god, you know right there so anyways where I'm going with this first of all you're gonna have to decide what kind of paper you want to use for your map what's gonna be um, you know basically easy for you to be able to keep um, track of basically distance miles so on and so forth as you design your map for me, like I said, I enjoy blank paper, and that's what I'm going to use for this video. So, the first thing is, when you do a wilderness encounter, and before we even get into map making and we get into building any of that, first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to, at that point, decide what creatures we're going to want to stock into our wilderness that are going to be encountered. So whatever game system you're using at that point, this is where you're going to want to go through and take, you know, take your time and read through them. As I said before, when it comes to um, at that point, wilderness encounters, they should be fierce and rare and aggressive. Um, here's a really good one. Let's take a look at this picture right here. These guys, you know, they don't look, uh, yeah. So, these guys are capable of fast movement by taking one of its heads into the mouth of the other and rolling across the ground like a large scaly hoop. Its bite is deadly poison, and it will gladly attack anything that intrudes on its territory. 
Okay, well, I'm thinking this is going to be a good candidate. So, at this point, I'm going to put down the Amp Fizionia. All right, and what I do to speed things up for my games, and it's entirely up to you, and I'm not going to bore you guys by sitting here and just like picking out a bunch of random stuff. So I will write down the name and then I will just put page number 12. And then I'm going to go through and pick out something else. Let me see, what else do I want to put into a wilderness environment? Well, I think a brown bear would be good. So let's put that down, page 16. A giant beetle? Well, there's something else you, you would encounter in the wilderness. Uh, I'm just gonna put giant beetle. Alright, that's page 17. We'll do like six encounters here. I'm gonna find last couple encounters I want to find something really nasty. Ooh, what is that? The be behemoth. Mm. What is... Perhaps the largest land animal ever to tread upon the face of the land, a behemoth is dull-witted, brute, so powerful even a dragon would prefer to stay out of its way. Built like a bear, an adult behemoth stands more than six meters tall at the shoulders. Whoa. But here's one thing as I'm reading it. Behemoths are mammals that live in tropical jungles and are strictly herbivores. Well, all right. Let's find something a little bit more aggressive. Wow, cave trolls. Yeah, I'm gonna use a cave troll. And we're gonna incorporate some caves into our map as well. And that's page 24. <sighs> now it does have um, dinosaurs in here. Um, I don't know. I've never really. I don't know. Let, let me see comments on this and let me know, you know, how you guys, you know, when you do your RPGs. But I've never really used dinosaurs a whole lot. I've just kind of. Uh, I don't know. Just seems a little awkward to me. Unless I guess you were doing something with Jurassic Park, then eh. let me see. Ooh. Oh, that's a good one. We could put some else in there. It's wilderness after all. But these would be more or less friendly encounters rather than that point at combat encounter. Ew, a head hanger. I gotta read this. The head hanger is a magical creature and a truly horrid beast. Its pallid, spiny, and claw-footed body resembles some sort of terrible cross between insect and reptile. Sprouting from the length of its flaccid body are many thin stalks, some of which support living heads. Man, this sounds pretty interesting. This powerful magical creature exists entirely on the souls and spirits of its prey, requiring no other nourishment. Headhangers prey only on intelligent creatures and cannot gain nourishment from consuming a fixed intelligent creature. Yeah, I got nothing to worry about. The beast serves 
the head of its prey, storing it inside its bulbous body. One day, 24 hours after the head hanger has taken a head, the head spouts on a stalk on the side of the creature's body, joining the ghastly collection already there. The head stays half alive for one month and every point of power the creature possessed before it withers to nothing and falls off the stock. Wow. Wow. So it's a magical creature. Ah, what the heck. Let's put one in. We're only going to use one though. We only need one head hanger. And I'm going to put a little asterisk by that, so I remember that that's going to be a... Basically, a one creature encounter only, basically, there. And it's kind of going to be the focus, basically, of um, my map, we'll say. in there. Eh, I don't know. Those can always be kind of... Scorpion Man. Scorpion Man is put together in much the same way as a centaur, with his chest and arms, head of a man, but with the body, six legs, and stinger equipped tail with a giant scorpion. Scorpion Men are chaos breed native to Glorantia and left over from the Great Darkness. They are found in desert areas and, well, that's not going to work for what I'm doing here. Shadow cats are magical beasts about the size of a bobcat and very small panther. Their bodies are indistinct, seemingly constantly merged with shadow and difficult to make out, even under the best of conditions. Quick and quiet, they are quintessential hunters. They will not battle creatures larger than themselves unless they are left with no choice. Shadow cat is difficult to see clearly. In game terms, the Shadow Cat is constantly under the effects of a Magnitude 4 Shimmer spell. Hmm. I like that. I think I'm going to add that in. And I'm going to make a separate little table bound here for nighttime encounters. It's going to be a Shadow Cat. All right, so let's move on. So I want to find one more good daytime encounter, then I'm going to do some nighttime encounters at that point. And hmm, a stingworm is a larvae of a watch beetle. Stingworms have long, soft bodies with short, stumpy legs near the armored head, which is equipped with two hooked jaws to inject digestive venoms into prey. There is actually the longest lived stage of watch beetle development. The creature actually spends more time as larvae than it does as an adult. It's also the largest stage of the creature's development. Adults watch blah 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 blah. Stingworms can be found on land or in fresh water. Huh. They actively hunt prey. Stinging worm prefers to lie in wait and attack from an ambush, gaining surprise on the hapless victim. I think we found our sixth one, so I'm going to put a sting worm in there. Alright. 
So those are going to be my daytime, and now I'm going to want to get some nighttime encounters. And normally nighttime encounters, at this point, I think I'll, I'll fill my world with obviously more, you know, nocturnal creatures at that point. A um, good example of one will be orcs. They're going to prowl and hunt at night. Okay, I'm going to speed things up here a bit instead of flipping back to the book. I think you guys get the idea. You got the idea. I know you guys do. You're smart people. So let's put this back down here. So I'm going to say my nighttime encounters. I'm going to put some orcs in there. And let me see. What about a night hag? Ooh, a wraith? I need two more. Let me think here. Um, let's put in a goblin. What the heck? Why not? We got an orc. And I'm trying to think of a really good one I could put in here. Really, really good one. Um, what about a shadow? So let me, I don't think, I don't know if the Rune Quest Monster Manual will have a shadow in there or not. Let me look at the index. Shadow cats, maybe they have it underneath shades. I bet that's probably what it is. Ah, here we are. Shades are elementals of darkness formed by shadows of night. A shade can only be summoned in a place where no light is visible. Once summoned and formed, the shade consists of a pool of inky midnight darkness which can move at will, even into broad daylight. Even the brightest light cannot penetrate the pitch black of a shade. And I think this is what I'm going to go with right here. And I'm going to put that in as an encounter. Um, so it's the wilderness. So where did the shade come from? Well, it's the wilderness. Anybody could have, at that point, summoned a shade. And left it out upon the world, right? Right. That's what I'm going with, and that's what we're going to run with. All right. So. I don't like my atrocious handwriting, so I'm going to make this a little bit more. Um, how do I put this? More presentable for me. Now, I'm not going to put the page number on here because this is just for a video. Is all it's for. I'm just going to put down the description and I'm going to put down friendly head hanger. Put Ascaris next to it. Only one. All right. And a stingworm. I'm going to go into the nighttime encounter. Put 
that point. We could have a shadow cat. Orcs. Night hag. A wraith. Goblin. And the shade. Okay. So this is by far going to be your biggest hurdle here, right? And well, I don't know. I don't know why I turn it upside down. I think I need another sip of coffee here. So this right here, believe it or not, what I'm going to show you is going to be your biggest hurdle. It's getting your encounters, basically, which you know, populating and what you want in there. Now from there, I'm going to base everything off of my D100s. So, but I'm going to look over everything first and at that point, what do I foresee? And you have to keep your characters in mind here because you could make like nighttime encounters, I don't know, you know, like you know, one to, I don't know, 98% a shade and, you know, everything else, <laughs> 1%, which they probably won't last too long. So what I'm getting at is you have to go through here and decide when it comes down to a percentage, basically population, if you want to look at it that way, what populates your wilderness, what's going to be logically more unless encountered more often so the brown bear most definitely so I'm going to I'm gonna say let's keep that at about uh, the 25% to maybe about the 60% range. Okay. Uh, giant beetle, I would expect. Yeah, why not? So we're going to say, I'm going to keep that from the 61. I'm going to run up to about 75. The cave troll, and I'm going to put in here cave only so this is going to be completely separate i'm going to keep that separate elves friendly well elves are pretty secretive creatures and they're going to be more rare so we'll get back to that and the head hanger we know is more or less that there's only one that i'm going to put on this map so that's going to leave us with this amphasuna or Sina or Sun Suinia. And I'm gonna say I'm gonna go seventy-six to mm, eighty-six. Eighty yeah, we'll go with eighty-six percent. Elf friendly, I'm gonna go zero one two at that point. Um 20, 23%. How does that sound? My head hanger, he's going to fall in between 24, because I got that at 23, so I'll adjust this up to 30%. And then I'll make this the head hanger. A 24 to a 30 percent. Now that's going to leave me at that point with the stingworm. So looking at my highest number here, which is 86, I'm going to go 87 to 100 percent encounter. And now I have that done. And I'm going to show you how this all relates in. I hope I'm not losing your interest in here, and I hope you guys are still hanging in there with me. So, nighttime encounters. We're going to do the same thing with this list. 
goblins, orcs. We're going to see a lot of these things, right? So I'm going to go with orcs being basically the most common. So I'm going to say uh, we'll start them at about 30% and run them up to about, why not, 75%. Goblins, um, I'm going to make them a little bit more scarce for this map. So I'm going to bring a goblin in between 0, 1 to 20%. Okay. Now, I'm going to focus on the Shadow Cat here. We're going to go 76 to... I'm going to say, heck, let's go 89%, there we go, so 90% to, I'm going to say 94 will be a night hag, and then 95 up to, we'll say 97, how does that sound? And then 98 to 100 will be a shade. So, as you can see, there's a smaller percentage of it being encountered, but yet it can still be encountered. Just, it'll help balance everything out with your characters, and that way you don't have to worry about getting overrun and killed. Okay, so we have encounters out of the way. That's... Believe it or not, that's going to be the hard part right there. Now, I decided to go with a temperate, basically, wilderness. So, in my wilderness, I'm going to want some light forests, heavy forests, and I'm going to say half movement in the heavy forest. I'm also, I'm going to want, um, I'm gonna want some hills. And then, why not make some marshes in this? And while we're at it, we'll add some swamps, rivers, you know, I told you I love my rivers. I'm going to put rivers, river I should say, shallow, river deep, okay, um, let's put some, we got some hills there, so I'm, I'm going to want some wide open grassy plains, so I'm going to put grassy plains, And then caves. So we're going to want to encounter some caves. That was the whole point of the cave troll and the cave systems. Now, same thing as you I've done with my encounters. I'm going to look at this and how do I foresee basically the wilderness I'm creating. How do I want that to actually um, take shape? Do I, do I want more forest, or do I want more hills, or so on and so forth? Well, the way I'm kind of imagining this is I'm going to want to go with some marshes. I want some pretty marshy areas. So I'm going to start yeah, about 35 to... I'm going to say 60%. Actually, heck, we'll go 70%. Okay. And then I'm going to go 71% upwards to... Mm, 88% we'll say on caves. Now, light forest... Um, because of all the marshes, it would make sense of all, because how 
basically saturated it is that the woods would be real hardy and lush. So I'm going to say from zero one to that point up to 34% is heavy forest. Now, let's move into light forest. So I'm going to say 89 to, eh, what the heck, 93. And then, I think I might adjust the marshes here. I think I got a little too much. I'm going to move that number up to, um, I'm going to say 55. Because I want to add some more swamps in too. So, let's go with, oh, what the heck. I'm going to say 20% to, uh, 28, I like that number. Now I'm going to hills, let's go with 29 to, at that point, 33%. Okay, because I got my marshes and everything, and I got my lush forest, um, I'm going to want some rivers. There's, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of water on my map. So, let's go with river shallow. It would only make sense. And, I just went up to 70, so I'm going to say 71 to... 81% river shallow, 82 to, oh, what the heck, 89, 88, I'm sorry, is our rivers deep. Now, I got a few numbers left here to deal out, and that's going to pick up right froth from here, so grassy plains is going to be 94 to 100%. Okay, and I'm going to show you how this all comes together and how I do this. And it really, it only takes a few minutes to actually go through this and, and make this up yourself. It's just, you know, deciding on how basically um, rare or more frequent a certain thing is going to be in your game. Okay, so... I now have, at this point, this done. I'm going to make a... I'm going to add some weather into this now. So I'm going to put, at that point, turn this over, and I'm going to add some weather. So... Weather. And I'm going to go... I'm going to use a 1D4 initially and I'm gonna keep this real random so um oh what the heck let's shake it up I'm gonna say the first number I roll will be summer and it's a two so at that point spring would follow first in this so one spring So what I would expect in spring will be rain, heavy rain, I'm going to put high winds, and thunderstorm, and then what the heck, I'm going to say pleasant. Pleasant or, how do I want to word that? Fair, there we go, fair. That's a good one for it. <clears throat> okay, so I got one, two, three, four, five. Now, at this point, you can use your percentage die. Um, when it comes to this, I just keep it relatively pretty simple. I'm gonna say spring, 1d6. So, I'm gonna say, one will be rain, two will be heavy rain, 
three will be high winds, four will be thunderstorms, and five through six will be fair conditions. Um, with heavy rain, I'm going to say at that point, half movement. Same thing with high winds. Shake it up a little bit there. All right. So now we're going to go into two, which is going to be summer. All right. So summer, extreme heat. Um. Very dry. I'm just going to put a uh, very dry. And then I'm going to add a percentage in here for drought. So I'll put that over here in a minute. And what else you can experience in the summer? So we're going to have extreme heat. We're going to have very dry. We are going to have thunderstorms. And then um, I'm going to say extreme humidity. Why? Because I live in Michigan. That's why. And we get extreme humidity here. So three is going to be fall. And well, before I get into fall, I got to finish this first. So real simple. I'm just going to say 1D4. No, I'm going to do 1D6. I'm going to shake it up. So extreme heat, 1, very dry, 2, thunderstorms, 3. Change my mind, and I'm going to put fair. 4, and then 5 through 6 will be fair. Um, very dry, and then I'm going to put drought. Um, well... Let's see here. Let's roll this and see what I come up with. 46. So... 46%. I'm going to put or higher. At that point will be drought conditions, which will be mean... Limited resources. All right, so that took care of that. Now I'm going to go into, got spring, summer, fall. So fall, we'll say. Fair conditions. And at that point, I'm going to say fog. Heavy fog. Rain, um, I'll say very windy, or wind and rain, how does that sound? Wind and rain. Alright, so we got, we got fair conditions, fog, heavy fog, rain, wind and rain. And, uh, um, cool, cloudy. All right, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but I'm gonna make that a 1D8. So, let's get away, I'm going to do this. Because with fall, you get a lot of cool, cloudy, and you get some fair conditions. So I'm going to say one and a two. One, fair conditions, two will be fog. Cool, cloudy, three, four. And we'll, go th we'll go up to five. How does that sound? So we'll say three through five will be cool and cloudy. Then we're going to have six will be wind and rain. Seven will just be rain, and then eight will be heavy fog. With the heavy fog, I am going to put only quarter movement. All 
and um, there'll be a penalty for sight, so I'll say negative two spot check. And when I go into my wind and rain, half movement. And fog, I'm just going to put down half movement. Okay, so let's go into winter. Now the winter, I'm going to say extreme cold. Um, snow. Heavy snow. Blizzard. Um, why not sunny? I'll explain that to you here in a minute. And I'm going to put cold and cloudy. All right. So extreme cold, and we got one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll do the same thing. I'm going to use 1d8 for that, right? So I'm going to say 1 through, hmm, how do I want to do that? Oh, yeah, well, why not? 1 through 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and now 8. So snow I'm just gonna say at that point half movement heavy snow is quarter movement a blizzard condition and uh, it's gonna be one eighth of a movement and a negative three spot Sunny, I'm going to put down a negative two to spot because of the reflection off the snow. And cold and cloudy will just be cold and cloudy. Now, extreme cold at this point, what I'm going to put down there is a percentage. And I'm just going to write this up as survival. this add that in 82% so 82% or higher you have to roll at that point against your constitution whatever game system you're playing um, for your character to basically see how they fare the cold being out in the wilderness and if they're going to at that point suffer any type of um, weather related injuries and why I'm at it I might as well do one for the extreme heat as well so I'm going to put survival 50% so I'm gonna say 50% or higher all right, guys, so so here's my tables to make my map to generate everything and to move ahead through there. You can do this one of two ways, however you want to do this. Uh, you can either go through and create everything first and then play through it, or you can create it as you play through it. Personally, that's the way I like to do it. So the next thing you're going to have to decide is scale. So when it comes down to one mile or one meter, depending on you know um, where you're watching this from, when it comes down to your measurement, and I'm of course here in the United States, so I'm gonna refer to everything in an inch. So on my maps, one inch, Boom, boom, is one mile. 
So that's my scale. One inch is one mile. Now, the other thing you're going to have to make a decision on is when it comes to traveling, and I'm going to explain the different ways that I do this, and it's totally up to you, is do you want to use a four-sider, six-sider, eight-sider, ten, or twelve? And these are going to represent your hour increments. So you decide how you want to break that up with your hour increments. And particularly with your travels in your encounters. Me, I like to go with the four-sider. So that's the way we're going to go. And we're going to start creating the map. And we're going to go from there. First thing I'm going to do, completely one random is four cider let's see what season and what our weather's like we've rolled a two it is summer i'm gonna roll my d6 two very dry well let me see if they're so dry it's drought conditions 64 um yeah they're drought conditions so, it's going to start out in the summertime, very dry with drought conditions, which means limited resources. So let's get this thing underway. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'd like to start out in the center, and here's the center part of my map, and I'm going to put a dot there, dot there. Dot here, dot here, there's a mile. Let's roll and see what is the first this point um, terrain feature that's going to be in the center of my map where this is going to start. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so you guys can, at this point, uh, Get a little bit there we go my hand may seem giant now but 67 you got a 67 so go over at that point to our train and 67 marsh and that's kind of how i foresaw it so now marsh, I'm gonna fill my marsh in and I'm gonna also double this as my legend. So my marsh, I think I'm gonna make it look like that. Like little cattails. So let me fill in my marsh. And I mean, it's pretty much this simple. I'm making my map. I can reuse when I'm done with this adventure for something else if I want to and just apply different encounters and weather if I want to or at that point just recycle what I already have. So one mile and how I break up my time measurement as I said before is I perceive my characters being able to walk three miles per hour. So, and basically, how I break that down in the wilderness is equal to one mile in four hour increments. And then, how I do mine is 12 hours. Travel, eight hours, camp, or rest, however you like to do that. So, I'm going to roll my four-sider. 
I have two, so after two hours, I forgot to put something on my encounter table here. And what you have to decide with this, now like the Oracle thing, how you can use a table for that, um, like with uh, Scarlet Heroes or Mythic. When it comes to my encounters, I keep it pretty simple. So I'm going to say right here, and just like when I play my RPGs, so at this point, 60% is a, it's, it's a low probability, but it could be an encounter. 70% moderate. I'm going to say 80 to um, 80 to 85, we'll say. High. And 86 to 100. And there's, it's a no-brainer. I'll just put um, yeah, why not? Watch out, monster. Or <laughs> watch out all right so I have made it two hours we'll say with my imaginary characters and now at this point I'm gonna roll the percentage die and I have a 50% well I'm not even anywhere near my low so no encounter so far another hour has passed so at that point we're up to three hours and now I have another two hours. So now I am a total of six hours into this, but I have moved out of this area at this point because this is the march. So I'm a quarter of that into that area, right? So we're gonna be right up about here. I'm gonna put a dot there. And I'm going to put a dot here. And let me see what the terrain is. And then see if there's any encounters. 83%. So 82 to 88 is a deep river that's running through there. So I think with my deep river, the legend I'm going to use for my deep river is going to be... Um, why not something like this? And I'm going to put an arrow on it pointing from the direction of the river. So I'm going to say my river is running this way. So at that point, I have a river running across this way. And draw my arrow through there. All right, and I'll just finish filling that in with the marsh legend. Okay, so now at that point, I'm gonna roll to see if there's an encounter again. And let's see how this goes. Seventeen percent. No. Oh, I should mark this down as daytime. And then I'm going to put at that point underneath here, nighttime. Nighttime, I'm going to drop this dramatically lower. Now I'm going to say anything um, 30% or higher. At that point is an encounter, a wandering encounter. And I just leave it at that. That's gonna cover the night time. So now I've come to, obviously we know we got a river here, so we got a decision. We can either um, 
see if we can find a way across a possible bridge something like that or we can try to walk down river up river whatever have you um and this is how i use my dice for my rpg so i'm gonna say anything above a 50 percent i'm most more than likely going to find a um makeshift bridge or such as like a fallen tree that wouldn't make sense because i'm in a marsh and there are no woods around here so not a fallen tree we'll say a makeshift bridge 99 percent so all righty so i'm gonna have a makeshift bridge that i found and i'm going to at that point mark that in here and i'm just gonna put a little note in for myself bridge all right so with the bridge how do i want to resolve the bridge well it could be and as way i'm looking at it is there a high probability that this is an old rickety bridge well no it's a sturdy bridge 49 percent i'm not above a 50 percent so it's a decent bridge it's safe and my characters at that point are going to be able to access and cross this bridge and now they're into this area beyond and if you remember at that point we're at the fifth hour mark here so i'm going to roll now the time spent locating and crossing the bridge to go into this area three hours have passed so now at this point i am into the eighth hour of our travels and i'm going to roll and see if there's an encounter around the bridge area or the river. Got an 18% low. No, so far I'm lucky now. Now that I'm over the bridge into this area, across the river, let's see at this point what terrain features are going to be there. Well, I have a 20% and the 20% is going to come in as heavy forest half movement well that explains where they found the wood for the uh bridge huh kind of cool how this works out isn't it so heavy forest how do i want to do that you know what i think i'm just going to keep it simple like do i want to do it like that actually i think i want to use the triangle shape like that for my heavy forest so now, this area is going to be heavy forested. And the movement now is half that we have crossed over into, at that point, heavy forest. So I'll measure that off and I'm going to see half movement, which, cool, yeah, it should actually be right there, so I'm right on the money. So half movement, right, that'd be a half hour, because I rolled a one, I'm going to roll that again, three, which would be one and a half. So two hours, it's taken two hours for my characters to reach now this point. Now within that two hours from here to here, have they encountered anything in this area? Well, let's see. Let's go to the daytime chart at this point. And I have a seven. Uh, no. So far it's been smooth sailing for them. So, and I said that's been about three and a half, and we were at eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I'm gonna say they're close enough that they're, they decide that they're gonna set camp here for the night. So now, 
it's nighttime and we already know we're in extremely um, harsh conditions it's very hot and dry and at that point resources are limited so even though they are in heavy forest do they find any firewood that is usable for them to burn let's see so I'm going to say, and I like to keep my stuff baseline 50%. I mean, that's pretty simple. Anything 51%, hey, there's a high probability. And the reason why I do it this way is it just makes things move along quicker. Is really what it does for me. So is there any usable firewood in this area? Yes or no? 96%. Yes, there is. Okay, so 96% they there is usable firewood in this area. Is there going to be enough to sustain the fire through the night? That's going to be the question. 60%. Okay, yeah, they're going to be able to find enough firewood at that point to sustain them through the night. So it would be at this point, depending on how you guys do it, they're going to send one or two people out to go and collect firewood. So what am I going to do? Well, they have set camp now. How long did it take them to set camp? And I'm going to say, let's say we have four adventurers in this, care, in this group. So two of them are setting camp, the other two are collecting wood. How much time has passed? three hours so it's now at that point dark and so as the characters are setting up camp and the characters that are collecting wood is there an encounter well let's see 64 percent yes there is and uh what do they encounter? 26. So 26 on my encounter table is going to be 26. I got a 20 and I got a 30 here. No, no, no. Huh. I didn't even catch that. Okay, so let's say 29%. So um, I had, because I had like 10% here just missing, um, is now goblins. So how many goblins are there going to be? Well, I'm going to roll a 1d6. Five. There's going to be a total of five goblins. How far out are they in terms of feet from my location? So you remember I got two characters collecting firewood and two other characters at that point camping. So I'm going to start with the camp. How far are they from the camp? Adding 2d6, 30 feet. So how far are they from the characters collecting firewood? 90 feet so they are closing in on the camp so it would be at that point I would have characters and I'd be measuring off on my table for my battle at this point and one inch represents five feet and they're a total of 30 feet so 5 10 15 20 25 30 six inches away and of course depending on the system that you're using at that point I mean, you can't see the goblins because they're over here um at that point you would go into to see if your characters are surprised if they heard them coming through the forest if they were alerted however you wanted to do that and then at that point combat would take place so as you can see it kind of uh 
well, broke things up there. As the two of the characters are setting camp and the other two are out collecting wood, uh, they had a group of goblins come in and at that point uh, divide and conquer, which I didn't see coming. So I would keep filling out my map that way. Now, let's say the battle is over with. How long did the battle... Yeah, we'll say how long did the battle last. Okay, the battle for them to defeat, search, remove the bodies basically from the area and all that and secure the camp took an additional four hours. So within that time frame of those four hours, all that activity and everything else, has that possibly alerted the attention of something else out there in the forest and drawn it to them? 25% no we got lucky we got real lucky so at that point four of the eight hours have passed so my characters aren't gonna get a whole lot of sleep right now I'm gonna roll this again another four hours so it's been eight hours so within the four hour period was there an encounter Yes, there was. So I can roll my foresighter again, and within which hour did the encounter happen? On the fourth hour. So this would be right at first light, right um, before the sun is ready to, well, first light. It's not dawn yet, it's just first light. What, at that point, has discovered the camp and is closing in? 40%. Orcs. How many orcs are closing in? And this time I'm going to roll 2d6. We'll see. Nine. Nine orcs are closing in. Okay, how far are they from the camp? Once again, 30 feet. And that's how I run my encounters and I build my map and I keep at that point expanding my map and going on so let's say battles over they're done camps broke down and they're gonna keep continue moving well they only have half movement in this heavy forest so <sighs> let's see how much time has elapsed four hours so they've been able to advance two hours so another half mile of that and there we go up to here up to there I'm gonna fill in my forest doesn't really look like triangles too much it's because it's starting to get late here is what it is Okay, so they're right up about here, and we're going into day two now of our wilderness travels. Now at that point within the four hours, were there any, have they encountered anything in the forest? 59%, no, close but no cigar. Now you could always add different modifiers at that point into this obviously to adjust your um, outcomes of your roles um, you know just all depending on how you want to do that well I'll back this out a little bit and oop wrong way and just going to cover this again for you real quick before I end this video because I think I think by this point you guys have seen how I do this and well and this is just basically the wilderness, just wandering through the wilderness. Now, I could add more tables onto that because this is my weather. And if I wanted to, I could put over here at that point 
a percentage for, we'll say, heck, why don't we split this up? Um, daytime, right? And I'll say a zero one to a ooh, 35, and then I'm going to go 36 to, why not, 59. Boom. Dungeon. Boom. Settlement. Okay. So now we have those in here. So we rolled a 59. There's a settlement. So now I'm going to add a little bit more to that. What kind of settlement is there out here? Well, there could be what they call a throp, which is basically, you know, a very, very small population, maybe 25 people. So I'll say population 25. Um, max, what the heck? Six buildings. Then I'm going to say village. Population. Ooh, we'll say upwards to about 300. And... Max... I'm going to say 16 buildings. Then I could put city. And I'm just going to leave it right there at city. So I'll say what's going to be more likely I want to have sprawled across my map. Um, we'll go with throps. This little, at that point, population sprinkled throughout. So I'm going to say 0, 1, 2, well, what the heck, 80%. 81 to 96% will be villages. And then 97 to 100% will be cities. So now let's see what, at that point, is going to drop in there on the other side of those forests. 89%. Well, it's going to be a village. And so I think as far as the legend goes for my village, I'm going to, why not, draw something like And I'll drop that in right here. So there's a village here. Now you could create another entirely different map at that point with your village, how you want to lay your village out. Now when it comes to your village, like I've said, it's at that point, what I like to do and for the demonstration of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle into some of my random table books here, right? So let me see here. Um, go. Here's the one I'm looking for. So the first thing I'm going to say, because let's say my characters were, were injured by the encounter, right? Not like badly wounded, but they can use some healing. Um, resources are limited, so maybe they're going to find something there that they could pick up, trade or purchase to help them along the way. So obviously the first thing is, what do we want to name the village? Well, I'm going to call it Village Artichoke. So 
So there is at that point a max of 16 buildings. Doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be 16 buildings in there, but well, let's see how many buildings are actually in there. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So I have at that point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So first thing I'm going to put in here is a temple. They can go to this for healing. And then I'm going to leave this right here with a slash. And then at that point when I create the NPC, I would annotate that with the village NPC. Quick name. And then that way I can always reference back to it in my journal notes. Second thing is, I'm going to want a marketplace. Okay. So let me go to my random tables and... Let's go into booze in the market. 21. In for starters, I'm gonna roll three different rolls to see what's in the booths in these markets. What's their main sailing points here? Well, I got a 43. So they have meat pies, so they have food, tasty food for sale. 47. They also have trotters. I don't. I'm going to re roll that. I don't know what a trotter is. 58. Fresh meats. And then 02. Street food and basically noodles. Well, by looking at the generated rolls that I have here. There's a lot of meats available. So at this point, um, one of these buildings is going to be a butcher. And of course, I imagine, I don't imagine I'm going to put it in there because of the rolls. There's so much at that point meat, which we know we're depending on those heavy forest. Um, I'm going to say there are, I rolled a 1d4, I got three, three hunters that I could create NPCs for, and at that point, if I needed to, I could always come back here and I bet you for the right price, one of these hunters would serve as a guide if needed to be, to get me out of a sticky situation or through a particular area on the map because they would know the ins and outs of that particular area. So that's how I do my villages and I set them up and now I could add a tavern in here if I wanted to. Um, that's another option. But what I like to do is put in what I'm going to use at the time, leave the left rest blank so if I ever come back through here and I do need something at that point, I still have these areas available that I can put those in and create them as I need them. But my rule of thumb is once they are created, they are set in stone and they don't go anywhere. That's it. So that is how I do at that point. Um, my villages, that'd be my throps. I, the throps, I'd be the same, same way. Um, the dungeons, how, how I would do that, or even the caves, because I did have caves on here. So, how I would randomize that and do that is at that point, let's say I have a cave system. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to roll 2d4. I want to see 
right off the bat how many rooms or chambers I should say this particular cave system is going to have four okay and at that point are they all going to be basically the same level or am I going to have to descent if they do and I could leave that up to percentage die but I'm going to say um, this particular cave system has got some um, I put it certain features to it to where it does at that point go deeper into the earth like levels in a dungeon and it has two so two levels and I could put one at that point chamber on first level on yeah, or I'll just put level one level two three chambers now um what I use now since I have gotten this book and I know a lot of you out there have it and you can do one of two things here um, you can either use the four against darkness system and at that point um, randomly roll and create those as you would like me I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this up to chance here let's see what we get so page 65 Let me go to all right. So here it is marked out, and this is just a page I picked out of this book that I love to use Dungeon for the Masters. But I'm going to use four of the cavern rooms based off of this. So at that point, I think what I'm going to do is use a template of something. Uh, one, two, three. That would be perfect right there. Focusing on this being my first level as they come in here. Now this as I'm going to draw out my map, they're going to come in here and at that point wind down a hill and they're going to have access to this area come around to this area, then what I'm going to do is connect these two or I could you could use it just as is or design it however you want to. That's how I like to use this book when I do this. It just kind of, it it's a surprise for me and it, generate stuff for me on the fly or you could break out your draft paper and you could say hey we come in here we came to a chamber like this at that point the chamber wound around this way opened up into another cavern area here which led us into this area over here forked off this way forked off that way to a cavern over here back to a smaller cavern area over here something like that I could throw together quickly on the fly and then at that point um, I would focus on at this point because it's underground my nighttime encounters so now this is I may do an, another video on dungeons how I do my dungeons so I'm going to say my cave encounters at that point 
Um, I'm just going to write it here. Cave encounters. And a 58% or higher. And that's the way I, I roll. That's the way I play these out. So my characters come into this room and, and count 58% or higher for cave encounters and I'll say monsters. And then I'm going to say uh, a 0, 1 to a 15%. There's a trap. Sixteen through fifty seven percent empty. All right. So as they move into this room, let's see what they find in there. Zero two percent. So they found a trap, and I can go on from there. And I have tables for traps as far as that's why I, you know, I like to collect these and use these. So let's go into dungeon room. No, I don't want dungeon rooms. I don't want names of towns. What I want are traps. What kind of traps am I going to run into? All right, take another sip of coffee here. I'm gonna finish up this um, trap encounter here real quick. And then uh, I'm just gonna do a real quick uh, recap if you guys are still with me, if you're not bored out of your minds. And um, go over how I use random tables to add more depth into my games at that point. All right, um, I'm gonna make this real quick and simple. Pit trap. Boom, they walk in and this area opens up. I'm gonna put myself a little note. Pit trap. Okay, so really quick to just uh, show you guys, I started a new RPG. Um, and now that you got an idea of how I do all this, and hopefully it works for you guys designing your own games a lot better. Um, oh, so I decided to upgrade to the third edition, because I have the second edition one of this campaign setting, but I decided to pick up the third edition. So... Just to show you guys how it evolves, I mean, I've showed you how I do that and give you some good examples on how to use them for yours. And um, now I'm going to show you a real, basically, um, end product of using those tables and everything that I do. And I'm going to show you some of these table books, how it plays out. So the story takes place in this area called Darkon. Inside of Darkon, there is a small in these woods here outside of Corvia. There are a village of elves at that point. They have had a concealment spell on their location that has protected them for most part for about the last three years, but now it's coming up on a full moon or a what they call a dragon moon. Which means at that point, their spell is going to um, wear off and they have to recast the spell because it only lasts for so long because of the ingredients that break down for the spell. So, two people have been tasked at that point to go out and collect these um, blood lily petals from the Holy Temple of Zahora, deep inside the necropolis. 
Now, in my game, and I'm going to get to this here, as you can see, kept it real simple. There's my terrain, there's my weather, there's my seasons. I have a time tracker that I keep on this. And those are the days before the full Dragon Moon. So, these are, this is Elark, and this is the village, which they started out in. And as you can see, I got a brief description of what it is. Um, it's when you get through the veil, the first thing you come to is a gatehouse that has stone towers that are interwoven with thick knotted ivy. Inside their village, they have, um, they do have a village guard, which consists of two heavy militias and one captain. They have a village master, which is Lord Nalar. They have village merchants, and I put those down here. But if you notice, right here, one through eight, these are the buildings that I put in there. There's a weaponsmith, blacksmith, uh, what I call sacred herbs, or um, an herbalist, um, a carpenter, or for carpentry to be able to build aerosmithing, stuff like that, because they're elves, they're wood elves, they live in the woods, and so everything revolves around woods. Um, they also have horse stables, clothing, basically, which is going to be like a market for them to go there and purchase clothing, equipment, other, so on and so forth, and a tavern. Now, these I have already created with NPCs, and I have them all at that point written out in here. And this is my journal that I started. This is day one goes into the herbalist and look like my herbalist okay Danib a well-respected personal healer for Lord Naylor has the gift of persuasion to empty your coin pouch he's always uh, wearing large gaudy rings with ancient el elfish symbols on them and he's always telling stories of how his wisdom has been passed down from his family bloodlines of, you know, the craft of herbs. But, he's always lusting for attention. He always wants to be the center of attention of everybody. And he always wants money to pay his debts at the local tavern. Because he has a little bit of a drinking problem as well, and he can't afford to pay all the time. So, as the adventurers walk in, he's, you know, pretty excited because he sees a payday coming. And at that point, even though they've been conditioned by Lord Naylor to go out on his quest to even save his hide, he doesn't cut him any deals. He charges him full price. Unlike the weaponsmith, Torel, who is an old scarred up ex-adventurer, runs a local weaponsmithy, and as the adventurers walk in, they can't help but notice the scars on his face. And, uh, you know, his wounds have made him lazy over time, and he will gladly give out advice to anybody that comes into a shop, particularly younger adventurers, some tips and tricks of the trade to keep him safe. Now, he does have a... Um, how do we put this... An affinity with my characters and because Lord Nalar and they're going out to do this for the village he has knocked 50% off the weapons list so let's explain how I do some of my NPCs and write them down and some of the their particular uh, traits and it goes on from there um, and I think you guys get the idea there. And this is my, just my gaming journal, the notes that I put down. Going all the way into night two. Um, not trying to get too far into detail, but at that point they had a run-in with Goblin. And it's not Goblin, Goblin in Forgotten Realms. They are just horrible, wicked, vile creatures. And, uh... Anyways, they got into one of their lairs, and this was made on the fly, 
this is the map that I had created and um, just to show you using my just my random tables and counters they started out here and then I have left my little notes if I ever go back here as to what's there and what can be at that point found and used and if you look I have like right here um, trap door they weren't able to get through here there's a trap door in luckily um, one of my characters was able to save from falling to his death but they couldn't get past this area into here so this part and this part is unknown it is undiscovered at this point as well as when they were coming through the walls are very um, unstable and there's a cave in so this is undiscovered as well they were not able to make it through here they did however find a secret door from this area that led down a set of stairs into a lower level as they pass through walking through because like I said it's so unstable there was another cave-in which resulted in them now being locked into this area this area as I put area not found they never found this secret area so as they moved on Ooh, I'm trying to get this into the map view for you guys. Uh, so, as they moved on and out, they found a secret tunnel at that point that had led out and into the forest. Now, to put this in perspective for you guys, that all occurred and happened With the net on out. Two days. There's the hidden village. These are the woods that they were passing through. And at that point, that's where they ran across this area. So. Alright, there is a right there an example for how I at that point use my uh, my tables and my gaming system and how I run my games use my journal use all of that stuff to keep creating a solo RPG now if you're still with me last thing before I end this video guys is these right here if you're looking to spice up your game a bit and you want some more randomness in it, but you don't want to break the bank? Check these out. Now, you can find these on Amazon for about seven bucks a piece. And this one was just uh, recently released. As a matter of fact, I got this yesterday. So I really haven't even had a chance to really get into this yet. Uh, um, but you know, you figure for under about 20 bucks you get that many random tables to help randomize your game and add more into this in your villages and even your encounters so on and so forth so i think this is gonna wrap this video up guys um it's getting late and i don't even know how long this video has been going for so um if you guys liked my video, click the like button. If uh, you haven't subscribed and just ran across my channel, please subscribe, click the bell icon, and you'll be notified when I upload another video. And if you guys really liked this video, how I broke this down and explained how I do my mapping and everything to you, let me know, and maybe I'll do one on a dungeon if you guys are interested in seeing that and break into that much more. But... Anyways, guys, I'm going to end this video here, and uh, game on, my friends. Game on.